Um, I don't think that causes disasters. Uh, and, and the question is that we're all talking about, and I threw some thoughts out, is why we pay the tax. And perhaps there might be a good reason, or perhaps you can argue there's a bad reason to pay the tax. If you get back to the Abacus deal, the Goldman deal, I don't think anyone um, would argue that they were front-running that particular deal. You know, a lot of things get very confused when you talk about the Goldman deal. And I know we want to avoid it being the all Goldman show. And I'll, I'll tell you, um, I, I spent seven years at Goldman. Uh, Twelve years ago, I left, uh, and I just wrote something recently that someone emailed me saying uh, that it was unfair that I wrote this essay without mentioning that I was at Goldman Sachs. So being employed ever at Goldman Sachs is now an item for disclosure. <laughs> you, you need to share this with people. Um, but it, it, I, don't, I, I think the, 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 the Goldman thing is, is a very important, narrow point that they might have gotten very wrong and should be punished if they did. If there was fraud that was both fraudulent and material, to the point where you could say one side wouldn't have done the trade and was harmed much more than they would have, the rest of it is what you said, is yelling about trading, is yelling about a, a bias against short selling. Um, if Goldman had gone long and lost money, which they kind of claimed to for a very short period, that was a little weak of them, I got to admit. Um, but if, if Goldman had, no one would have a problem. I mean, you have this odd world now where we kind of look at Lehman and Bear and say they were criminally stupid, and we look at Goldman and say they were criminally smart. <laughs> and it, it's just hard to imagine those are both true. Let me just, I want to add one sort of Chicago booth standard perspective here. Remember the average investor has to hold the market and that active trading is a zero sum game. So that anytime you do anything but hold the index, you're extra long something, somebody else, has to be extra short that something. So anything you think is a good idea, somebody else thinks is a bad idea. Now, it might be the guy you bought it from, but it might be somebody out there. So caveat emptor. John, John <laughs> one way to phrase that is the puzzle isn't so much why efficient markets doesn't work. It's why, after all the evidence, so many investors don't believe in efficient markets. So many people are, are paying a lot of money to try. You know, to anyone going market. long or short mortgages was thinking they were going to beat the market. Yep. They weren't embracing efficient markets. All the theory. children but are above Cliff, average. But Cliff, that's behavioral finance, which I and that's which been, I trade that's every been day. A, that's not, been a, that's I'm been a heretic a big, enough. It's been to, a big area. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, let's listen well, to these guys. And elsewhere. <laughs> let's hear what their yeah. questions are. There's um, some mics right. on either end of the room, and it's it's hard to see. So I'm going to suggest that the people with mics. I think there's four of you. Just find folks and, and uh, maybe move around the room as, as people ask questions. I see a mic over there. Do you want to? Come on, there's no Don't questions. Don't be shy. There are only a thousand of these. It's like my classes. <laughs> That's right. Thank you. Uh, my name is Duff Armstrong. I just have a quick question. I think it's, first of all, thank you for doing this panel. Uh, Professor Cochran asked a question, I think, early on. What, why does our financial system require so much debt? And in hearing everyone talk about the various issues, I'd like to hear your all's opinion on, is it not so much a question of regulations inside a system, is it a question of, is the system broken? And is it the debt-based monetary system that really is the source of instability that maybe Professor Rajan is looking for? And is that a source of, uh, I'm curious your all's thoughts. Thank you. I, we do I, have I, a fragile I, would, I, I just want to say, you know, people who say the system is broken, uh, we just, we had a huge crisis and, you know, it's obviously caused a lot of dislocation. But remember, for 30 years, sort of since 1980, the global economy has been unbelievable within this system. And there's been a huge amount of good that has come out of it. Now, did, you know, did Goldman Sachs derivative trading drive this? No. but. Uh, there's certainly a lot that finance and things that have come out of uh, business schools and businesses in general have driven that have been terrific. And there's this real danger of not only shutting the barn door after the horses have left, but shutting down the farm. And you really don't want to do that. You want to, there are, were a variety of things that went wrong in this crisis. And I, you know, Ragu, you know, has written a book about them. And, you know, global capital glut, you had interest rates were too low, you had too much emphasis on housing to people who couldn't afford the housing from the government. You had rating agencies who made mistakes. And what you see, if you look at history, 
the markets tend not to make the same mistake twice. So we had a junk bond crash in the late 80s and you had a, a highly leveraged transaction crash. That didn't actually happen this time. You had an LBO boom and everybody was saying, oh, all these things would default. They actually didn't. The, that market has been, you know, hasn't been great, but it, it didn't fail in the way the subprime market did. So I think there, there is this tendency to over-regulate and not trust um, some self equilibrating mechanisms, and I think there is a role for the government to, to tweak and to get the regulation uh, better. Now, I don't know whether government will do that, but it should certainly but it's not, not all government. I mean, it, it, where the financial system, you know, here's a vision for the financial system. Mortgage-backed securities should come back. They make lots of sense, but they should be held in a long-only mutual fund in your pension account rather than through a, through a chain of highly leveraged intermediaries, each of which is promising there's no risk on the other end. That would be a great system. And then, you know, when, more, when house prices go down, you lose 5% you know, yeah, in your... Uh, but it doesn't... You, in the end, are holding the equity and the debt. So when you give money to Cliff, why do you give money to Cliff, 90 cents of it debt, 10% of it equity? It's all your money in the end. I think, I think I, sort of our well, theory well, some, points some to a much more hours. streamlined transaction. Uh, no, I think <laughs> what the questioner was asking, because I get a lot of emails about this, there's a very popular idea in many parts of the country, I think Ron Paul is the most famous promoter of it, but that there's a more fundamental question. Fractional reserve banking is inherently destabilizing. Yeah. So, uh, let me address that because that keeps coming up every time you have a crisis, right? And so what people want, Lawrence Kotlikoff has written a book on it, a famous academic from Boston University. Um, let's get rid of leverage. Let's have all equity banks. These, is, uh, these will work wonderfully well. We'll have no problems. Well, let me ask you a question. Given that what you know about banks, how prepared are you to invest in them, no questions asked? and wait for them to pay dividends at some point. I mean, people are going to demand a very high rate of return if they're going to lend essentially till infinity uh, to an entity that they have know nothing about, don't know what the trades are, there's no transparency, completely opaque. You're going to raise the cost of capital to intermediation tremendously if you go to all equity firms. I think that's, that's sort of the learning that we uh, corporate finance guys can at, at least contribute, saying there is actually an increase in cost of capital when you want to do it this way, because there's absolutely no control that investors have over what's done with their money. So it might be a more stable world, but it's a much poorer world. It's a yeah, much costlier I mean, I mean, world. That's exactly. really important. If you take, exactly. take Steve exactly. and Raghu's point together, people, rightly so, did focus on disasters, but wrongly so, miss the 30-year mean. Right, um, if, and I'm, I can't prove this one way or another, but you can have a policy that is more prone to disasters. Counting those disasters over a hundred years will deliver more growth and more prosperity. So it's very e it's, I shouldn't say it's very easy, but you can create a perfectly safe system. Um, you can create a perfectly safe boat that goes at one knot. Um, it's 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 not that simple. There's a there's a pro and a con. General regulation. If you move to all equity financing. Um, it, it's reminiscent, I don't want to open this can of worms of a, of a gold standard kind of concept. Everyone goes, oh, that's safe and safe. Well, the same people what does say it do, gold standard. What does it do to growth? What does it do to the ability to grow an economy we over want to know time? What the, uh, what the objective is, right? I mean, is the objective to minimize the number of disasters and their impact, or is the objective to, you know, maximize the, the, the total uh, growth, wealth, whatever it is? And I don't think we understand that yet, right? Yeah, that's, we, we, that's, a we, good, that's a good topic. Yeah, no, it is. Yeah, good, yeah, we, but we, we, I think we have a pretty good idea. But that's, <laughs> you you another, know those weights? <laughs> Steve, Steve's right. I don't. Let, let's, let's not overdo it. So we had a run. We had a little flight to quality, something we kind of understood, yeah. dusted off the shelves. Yeah. That's over. The financial system gave us great things. To, to say it's broken fundamentally, I think, is a, is a big exaggeration. Now, it might be broken very soon. It might be a government-regulated <laughs> utility, and that would be a shame. You know what, I think we should jump into that issue. Uh, we've touched on it, and I think maybe to shine a light a little more, what, what are you guys the most afraid of uh, about what, what might come out of Congress? And, and I keep hearing from people who are very f much for aggressive reform or aggressive regulation is that, oh, this is, the fight's not over. They might think it's over, but we're going to keep pushing. Um, Simon but, Johnson but, but told Adam, me. But Adam, is that, yeah. is that a well-formed view, or is that a, we need aggressive reform? with no follow-on. We need to hurt these people. 
Um, or does it have a lot of specifics? I'd say 98% it is, it's a knee jerk unspecified, but Simon Johnson, who you know, had Raghu's job after him at the IMF, Paul Volcker, there are people well, who they have- they had a down tick. Huh? I said after Raghu, they had a down tick. Yeah. <laughs> so I have, a, you know, the concern that, that I think you, you might worry about is that, you know, there clearly was a role here uh, of Fannie and Freddie buying subprime loans and the government saying they had to do that. And I don't know how big an effect it, it was, and that's something that people can research, but it was a factor. And you still have the FHA guaranteeing loans with 97% loan to value ratio and so you still have this system where you're probably putting too yeah. much leverage into houses that shouldn't be so leveraged. So that Fannie has gone up. And the, so there and Fannie and Freddie are still still burning government money. So I think the 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 worry I would have is that that part of the problem doesn't get fixed. And the other part is just that the, whether you call it too big to fail, whether it's the long term debt not converting but getting, doing something there where you can um, take out, you know, financial institution gets into trouble and you can restructure it without having to put in government money, you let the private sector take the hit. My, my issue is I just don't trust politicians. I mean, I, I don't trust them for, for two reasons. One is I don't think they, they understand uh, the stuff as well. And secondly, we have a long history, and I've done some work on this, Raghu has done some work on this as well, where if you look back in history at financial regulation, a lot of it is motivated by private interests of those politicians, sometimes with unintended consequences that hurt the people they claim they're helping. Another interpretation, of course, is that they knew exactly what they were doing. And we, we've seen, we, this isn't the first time. You go back to the, the 1873 crisis, uh, you, you look at what's happened when, the, when this country was emerging and you see lots of evidence of this. So that's one thing that scares me is that the, the objectives that you know, they, they say they have may be very different. And even if they have the right objectives, it's not clear they know what to do to, to achieve those objectives. The other thing I'll also say too, and I think is not appreciated enough is the uncertainty with, with what the government's gonna do. That, has, that can have a crippling effect on markets. So you heard a lot of people, you know, just, just that uncertainty of what they might do and how that might affect things can actually stifle um, growth and, and innovation. And more than uncertainty, some stable, understandable set of rules of the game, if that's what we meant by regulation, even if those rules weren't right, might make sense. What I worry about, we're heading towards um, officials of the government have unlimited power to do whatever they want. Designate you systemic, whatever the heck that means, completely undefined, anything can be systemic, and then do anything to you they want to. Uh, arbitrary power like that, that could lead to a big disaster. And they're just supposed to look over the shoulders of the big banks and kind of tell them what to do and not to take too much risk. That, right. uh, that's a very dangerous structure. And that uh, seems to be what we're talking about with regulation. Well, so John, that's one danger. Uh, but yes, as, the danger. As the, as the uh, designated lefty on the panel, let me, <laughs> let me offer another danger. Which on this panel means less riding. Less yeah. riding. <laughs> hey, you, you said the words prices off the uh, rails. I mean, heresy here. <laughs> let, let, I mean, the, 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 the other nightmare vision, one is of, of over-regulating and, and, and maybe even increasing risks in the system. I mean, for example, I think breaking up the large banks into small ones doesn't change things that much, may in fact have, you have 20 small banks taking the same risk that one large bank took and you've got a, you know, too, too many to fail problem rather than too big to fail. But, but I wanted to uh, talk about the, the other issue, which is we talked about Fannie and Freddie. Nightmare vision for me is the 19 large banks in the U.S. coming out of this crisis all being Fannies and Freddies because they've got the guarantee of the government behind them. Yep. Yeah. So That's in order to get the market working again, we need to somehow ensure that all the stuff that has been put beneath them now is taken away, that somehow we convince the markets again, we will let these guys fail. So I think That's Steve it. brought up the point, too big to fail. That to my mind is a central issue. If you come out of this crisis, without somehow convincing the market they have something to lose when they lend to these guys, we've got 19 Fannies and Freddies with us, not just two. I think we I all agree on this. The actually. only way to do that is lack of legal authority. If the government has the authority to bail out, bailout. then they're gonna do it. I, I like to run the counterfactual, now these are not mutually exclusive. 